Hello everyone and welcome back to the continuation of our video series Calculation of Seismic Loads in the ASC 7 2016 and its comparison in Autodesk Robot. In today's video, we are going to discuss a hand calculated example and we are also going to discuss the steps needed to implement the example in Autodesk Robot. However, a dedicated Autodesk Robot video is going to be published after that very soon. Please note that this is part of a bigger video series talking about the ASCE 7 seismic loads and I will be linking on the top right for this video series. And with that being said, we are ready to jump into the video. So sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Alright, so in this video we are going to do a hand calculation for a simplified structure because hand calculating simplified structures is fun. And I want to show you that Autodesk Robot is perfectly able to do everything for you because this is going to be a comparative lecture. First things first, what is my structure? My structure is a five-story building. You can see that the bay width in the x-axis is five meters and the bay width in the y-axis is four meters and the story height is 3.5. I'm giving you those dimensions because I want you to try recreate the same thing. Our entire structure is made up of reinforced concrete frames and notice there will be some simplifications uh, because I know reinforced concrete frames in 3D is not that easy to be done, but well, it is what I have. All beams are 300 by 500 millimeters. All columns are also 300 by 500 millimeters. Notice the orientation. Some of them are horizontal, some of them are vertical. And the own weight of concrete is 23.6077. This is needed for the dead load calculations. And the slab thickness is 150 millimeters. This is for the slab. And we have a superimposed dead load of 10 kilonewton per meter square in addition to the self weight. This is the dead load needed for the, and the self weight to calculate W, the load of the structure, and no irregularities as you can see here. Furthermore, I am not assuming any inertia reduction because I want to calculate by hand. But in reality, you should do a inertia reduction. For beams, it is 0.35, and for columns, it is 0.7, and so on. I don't want to do this because I want to be able to hand calculate things. All right, now, this video might be your guideline into using ASCE 7, because I will be applying every single step in order. And to help you, I have done, first of all, the weight calculations. And to help you, you will see later that I have done this table for you. What I'm calculating, What's the value of what I calculated based on what and why did I calculate that? So I think that this will come in handy for you to study. Anyway, back to our slide. We need first of all to calculate the weight. Overlaps here are ignored. I know that the beam is partially overlapped with the slab and partially overlapped with the column. I'm ignoring this, sim this thing for simplification purposes because I want to mimic the structure, the software. So our superimposed dead load is basically the area of the slab 10 times 8 because 10 times 8. And the load is 10 kilonewtons. So if you multiply them together, you get 800 kilonewtons for superimposed dead load. Then you have the beam self weight. And the beam self weight is, first of all, the total length. It's 3 times 10 plus 3 times 8. 3 times 10 is because I have three beams having length of 10. And 3 times 8 because I have another three beams having a length of 8. Once again, ignoring the intersections of beams. So I know that there are paths that have been calculated twice. However, we are not in a quantity surveying lecture, we are in a structural lecture, so I will ignore that. So that's the total length of the beam. Now the beam area, the cross-sectional area is 300 by 500, so 0.3 by 0.5, that's 0.15. And the load is, of course, the total volume, which is length multiplied by area, multiplied by the mass density, which gives you this value. For the columns, the area of the column, once again, is the cross-sectional area. And the length of the column is 9 times 3.5, because I have 9 columns, each one of them having a height of 3.5, once again, ignoring the intersections. The total load is the volume multiplied by the mass density, and you can see that it's 111.54. The slab is this area thing. The area is 10 times 8. Once again, ignoring the intersections of 80 meters square. The thickness is such and such. So the load is the volume multiplied by the density, which is given. Finally, this is the load of the story. This W is needed for the vertical distribution and also to calculate the total weight of the structure, which is 6,930 kilonewtons. Fantastic. So we finished our weight of the structure, which is needed because V, the base shear, equals CS multiplied by W. Now, if you missed that lecture, it's highly, highly recommended you go check this out again. So I'll link it on the top right. So now our mission objective is to find CS. And there is a ton of things you need to find to find CS. SS, S1, TL, SD, and so on. All of those need to be known. So how do you know those values? There are a lot of values depending on the location. 
Those are marked here. You can see the word location besides the values, for example, here. And there are some values, as I said before, that depend on the location. So you need to have some sort of reference or map to access them. Let me show you what I mean. So I just opened the link that I have had. The link looks as follows. It's in the Earthquake USGS design maps. Let me show you how you can get to that. If I copy this link and paste it here, you are redirected to the USGS Seismic Design Web Services. This is a web service that provides you a JSON, and this is for programmers, JSON data for the thing that you want. For example, here, there is ASC 7 standard. If you click on that, 2016, you can see how you can use this API. You can, now, you don't need to have an API. You can select it from a map. But here I want to show you, if you are a US resident, how you can use it. And the idea is you paste a code here and it will give you the values. So if you paste this code, I change it a little bit. I ask it to be a risk category of two because of a residential building. And I ask it to be the sky class, I think of B, I forgot. So my values are different than those values it gives you. Now, there are a ton of values given here. And those values are explained here exactly what they mean, what SD1 means, what SD2 means and so on. You should check that out. So whenever I call location, it means I took it from this. This is the data I got. In order for you to be able to recreate this, I have given you the link in the slide. So if you go to the slide, you can see that the link is there. You can even type this and you will get the same values as mine, the exact same values. Depending on the browser, you might not see it like this, but the data is the same nonetheless. I once again want to reiterate that everything mentioned here is being explained before. You should check it out. Because there are so many coefficients, I'm trying to help you understand them by understanding where I got from and why do I need it. So based on what has it been found and needed for what. So from where and where to go with it. Now for the key factor risk category, I assumed it to be risk category 2, residential building. I had this discussion with you where I don't know whether it's 3 or 2. And I asked you back then to tell me in the comment section what you think about it. How do I get this to residential? I get it based on table 1.5-1. I'm giving you those references because I want you to be able to make a calculation sheet out of it. Because when you do a calculation sheet by hand, you need to cite every single table you use. Now, why do I need the risk category? For a lot of things, one of them is IE, the importance factor. So going to the importance factor, the importance factor is 1. Based on what? Based on table 1.5-2 where you enter with the risk category. Why do I need this? I need this because I need CS. CS has an equation which includes the importance factor. Then we need to get our four values taken from maps. We need to get our maximum considered earthquake spectral response acceleration at one second period. This is the acceleration at one second period. And uh, you need also to get the same acceleration at short periods. Those are things that are class or location specific and those are taken from the map. Furthermore, you need to find the long period transition period, and you need the site class because it is necessary for other things. Actually, I'm telling you exactly why it's necessary. I'm not sure I think I blunder, I think my teaching assistant blundered this. I don't think it's unitless, but I don't know, I'll just keep it. I think my teaching assistant has blundered a unit here. It doesn't matter. So 0.669, and why do I need it? Why do I need S1? I need S1 because I need to calculate from it SM1 and CS minimum. Why do I need SS? Because of SMS. Why do I need TL? Because I need to calculate CS maximum and, and other things. Why do I need the site, site class B? Because I need to find FA and FV. Everything has been explained before. So when I say FA, this might be a, this is where you should pause the video. Look, if you are overwhelmed, if you are overwhelmed by those symbols, you should pause the video and check out the first video in the video series where I explained those symbols for you. Now, the short period side coefficient FA, you see the FA is taken from table 11.4-1. And we just said, we just said that we need the side class, among other things. So if you go to table 1.4-1, uh, you can see that you need the side class, which is B in this case, and you need the SS, which is 1.88, meaning we are at um, more than 1.5. So based on that, FA is 0.9, and you can see me putting it here. Then we need the FV, but based on what? The FV is found based on 11.4-2, and for it, you need to enter with a site class, which is B, and you need to enter with the uh, S1, which is 0.669. So we are here, which means 0.8 is our FV. Fantastic. Now, why do I need FA and FV? Because I need it for SMS and SM1, and that's what I will do in the next slide. For SMS, you can see SMS is FASS, and I kept the previous table tabbed here because you might want to see every time back and forth, which is the maximum considered spectral response acceleration. 
for short periods and for one second periods. So SMS is the FA that just calculated, which is 0.9, multiplied by the 1.88, which is the SS, which is here. And this is based on equation 11.4-1, and that's the value. Now, why do I need it? Because I want to find SDS, and this is one of the most important factors I need to find because it calculates CS. For SM1, um, it is FV multiplied by SS, so that's FV, and that's SS from the previous slide. No, it's not SS. That's incorrect. It's S1. Uh, my teaching assistant seemed to have blundered another symbol. This is S1, not SS. Okay, did he miscalculate? Let's see. No, it's okay. It's just a blunder in symbols. Because he's using S1, you can see this is S1, and he's using S1 here, so disaster averted. Uh, yeah, this S1 was a little error here. Sorry about that. Uh, you can find this from equation 11.4-2, and it's necessary for SD1, which we have done. Now we go to SDS. For SDS, based on equation 11.4-3 and dash 4, it's just two-thirds of whatever you have calculated previously. So SDS is two-thirds of SMS, and SD1 is two-thirds of SM1. So yeah, that's the calculation. Why do I need those things? Those are very important because those calculate CS. And CS is the most important factor of them all because the base shear equals CS multiplied by W. So that one is the most important one of them all. The response modification factor R is 3, and it's based on table 12.2-1. This is the biggest table, or one of the biggest table in the code, and I've taken it because I assumed C7, which is an ordinary moment-resisting frame. I have a concrete frame. It's an ordinary moment-resisting frame because there are three types, ordinary, intermediate, and special. I'm choosing an ordinary moment resisting frame. So based on this choice, R is 3. Why do I need this? Because I need to find CS. Finally, I need to find CT and X for the fundamental period. Why? Because the fundamental period's equation looks like this. It's CT times H and X. And we said before that we need to find CT and X from a table. This table is 12.8-2 and is necessary for T. And from the table, it's 0 0.0466 and 0.9. So based on that, I can find the fundamental period which is basically the height of the structure. I have five stories times 3.5, that's the height, power 0.9 multiplied by the factor. So that's the fundamental period of the structure. This is TA, but we said that we can use TA for T. So everything is fine. Now for the grand finale, we have everything we need, so we need to find the base shear. How do I find the base shear? The seismic response coefficient CS from the basic equation of 12.8-2. It's this equation as the SR something. So we apply that. However, this is limited by a max and min. The max limit is equation 12.8-3 because T is less than TL. So that's the limiting equation, which you can see will govern. And you have a minimum equation based on 12.8-5 and dash 6. But I'm only choosing dash 5 here. And you can see that the minimum is such and such. By the way, you don't need to check the minimum because the maximum is already governing. So the minimum doesn't make sense. But still, it's good to apply it. Finally, the base shear is V equals CSW. And you can see it here. 1,406. This is our magic value. This value is the value that attacks the structure from the bottom. There was one very important thing we need to have checked before, but I ignored it. I needed to check if I even can use this equivalent lateral force method. Well, the answer is yes, because there is a lot of questions. One of them is the seismic design category, and the seismic design category is D, and I can use this method. Despite the seismic category being D, I can use it because one, my building is 48.8 or less and has no irregularities. Now we go to the vertical distribution. Please notice the channel members because the channel members have access to my PowerPoint. There is a correction in the PowerPoint here. The teaching assistant has assumed this K, which is incorrect because my fundamental period is 0.586. So you should have interpolated. So those values, the channel members are different from what you have in your slides. So please correct them once you see them. I will keep repeating this warning every single time because I know some of you skip some timestamps. So I want to keep repeating this warning over and over again. Now to do this, I need to find the weight multiplied by the height with an exponent divided by the total. Now the exponent K is taken from here based on the fundamental period. It's 1.043. And for each story, I need to find this value. Wx, Hx power K, which I do. You can see for each individual story, I am calculating the W times the H power K. This is, by the way, something we calculated in the beginning of the video. And in the end, I need to find the sum because the ratio CVX is this value divided by the sum, which I do exactly here. Of course, in the end, the addition of all the CVXs must equal to 1 as a final check. And now since I have the CVX, I need to use it by multiplying the CVX by the base shear 
to find the ratio or the share of the Shia per each story, which is 88.58 and so on. Of course, addition once again must be 1406. The total shear on a story is the addition of all the forces above. This has not been ex explained before, but let me explain it to you. If you have a structure and you are applying forces like this on the structure on each story, then there is a shear force diagram you can draw. The shear force diagram, well, is the addition of all the forces. In the beginning, it's just the force on the top story. Then a new force gets added to it. Then a new force gets added to it. Then a new force gets added to it. And the maximum shear happens at the story number one because it carries all the forces on top of it. You can see it happening here. Basically what happens is, for story 5, the load is the shear, and then I keep adding. I keep taking the value, adding the fx to it, and putting it here. Take the value, add fx, put it here. Add fx, and put it here. Add fx, and put it here. That's how I calculate the shear. Once again, notice the channel members that those values have been slightly corrected. And very important, each direction is independent, meaning you could have frames in one direction and shear walls in the other. And it's very important that you select the correct things on each one of those sides. Now let's implement this in RSA. This will be done in the next video, but I want to show you how you would implement it in the slides. So to implement it, you would have to model the structure, and then you would have to play with the inputs of the analysis. In the analysis type, you would have to select load mass conversion and basically open it. And inside it, you would have to convert the case number one, which is dead load, to a dead load. Then when you create your seismic equivalent load, you would have to mention that it should disregard density, and I will explain why later. You should include the eccentricities of 5% according to the code. And in the values, you can see me putting the values exactly as I have them. And based on those assumptions, the calculation should be very close and i will show you this in the next video but it's it is actually those are the shears on each story you can see that in story five the shear is very close to what i calculated story four same thing story three same thing and two same thing and one same thing now dear channel members once again i want to mention that a correction has occurred the values are different but i can see that rsa is giving me or my manual calculation shows that RSA is giving me good results with a difference of 4.3. Now the question is, why is there a difference of 4.3? Many reasons. One of them is because I ignore the location of the center of gravity. The height of, for me, like the location of the center of gravity is exactly in the floor, despite the fact that the robot knows that the center of gravity is a little bit lower because of the columns. So there are some differences, but they are insignificant. 4% is okay for a software. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. For the next video, I will be doing this in robots live. So stay tuned for that. And with that being said, I want to give a manual sized shout out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as their support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and so on especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.